everyone has an opinion about Canadian federal politics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's saying, wait a sec here. Why is it before Trudeau, my mom with this job could buy a house, but now it's not possible. And they look around and say, Jagmeet Singh is offering exactly what Trudeau is offering. So who does that leave? The one guy who, who's actually delivered affordable homes when he was minister, who offers a common sense plan to reward hard work. You know, there's a misconception that young people just want a freebie from the government. That's not true. A freebie might be temporarily satisfying, but it's not fulfilling as a, as a life. Work is about not just about having uh, a living, it's about having a life. And pe young people want to work, they want to start businesses, they want to achieve something, they want to get married and have kids. Everyone has an opinion about Canadian federal oh, politics. Yeah. Hey gang, what's up? Just Aaron right here, Canadian Looney. We're going to take an opportunity now to get to know Pierre Poliev and his wife, Anna Poliev, a little bit better. They seem like real Canadians. Can you imagine sitting down with Trudeau and his ex-wife or whoever his new uh, partner is? I've heard he made a crazy announcement. Who cares? Nobody cares about that. Anyway, Pierre Poliev and Anna Poliev definitely seem like real people. They could be fooling me. I don't know. But uh, if they are, they're good at their game. Let's take a look and a listen. Pierre Poliev does get into a bunch of the new policies he's going to implement once he's elected. We will have to wait and see what he actually does, but we're going to listen to what his plan is and what the fallout of the Trudeau government has been. Let's take a look and a listen. We have two very special visitors at TLN Media Group today. Mr. Pierre Poiliev, leader of the official opposition, and Mrs. Anna Poiliev. Welcome to TLN. Thanks for having us. We're great to be grateful to be here. Thank you. It's good to be here. So before we get into the serious questions, I think our audience would love to know a little bit about your background, Anna, your connection to the Latin community. Uh, well, I was born in Venezuela. And uh, my family migrated here in Canada in 1995. When I was eight years old, we moved in the east side of Montreal. And I'm a proud Venezuelan, and uh, we continue sharing the culture. We speak Spanish to our children, and they're both uh, bilingual. So, yeah, that's my connection. And I'm sure you've had a lot of opportunities to get to know the Latin community, the Latin culture. Is there something that has surprised you or impressed you about us? Well, what first surprised me is that after we started dating, I woke up one day and there were like 15 Latinos in my house uh, staying overnight. <laughs> I was like, holy smokes, what happened here? <laughs> so when you marry a Latina, you marry the whole family. Yes. Uh, but that actually comes with great ben benefits because her aunt and uncle are really taking care of our kids. That's why we're here in Toronto. And they are in Ottawa with our little ones. Without that, we couldn't, I actually couldn't do this job as, as future prime minister and she couldn't be on the road supporting the cause. Uh, so that uh, family value uh, that extends not just to the, the immediate, but also to the extended family is a great benefit to us. And you mentioned your children, you know, they are biracial, they will speak three languages, and that's something that's very common in Canada with all the different cultures. What is a typical day in the Poiliev Galindo household? Why don't you kick this one off? <laughs> Uh, a typical day, well, they go to daycare and school, so a typical day is just, you know, wake up, mom wakes up, if dad is around, he helps, we divide and conquer, we each take one, if not, I'll do my best, and uh, they go to school, and uh, we come back, and Pierre does the best he can when Parliament is sitting to come home around dinner time, so that we can have dinner, and put the kids to bed together, and then he goes back to his home office, of course, and works more until later on, but uh, it's, it's spending time with the family as much as we can. And is dinner Canadian or are you making arepas venezolanas? Arepas venezolana, un placer, pabellón, pabellón criollo a cada noche prácticamente. Sí. And now speaking of Venezuela, um, I did see that both of you posted recently, you know, calling out the elections that are happening. And I would love maybe for you to give, as a Venezuelan, our viewers some insight on the current situation, perhaps your thoughts on it, and just shed some light into what's happening. Uh, well, so as we know, um, it's been under the Chavez and uh, Maduro regime, as I say, since 1999. And we have an opportunity in five days in the next election to elect Edmundo, who uh, also uh, 
comes in pair with Maria Corina Machado, who's an amazing woman that I had the chance to meet. And it's a real chance at bringing democracy back in our country, uh, bringing back the best. Uh, as we know, Venezuela is a country that is absolutely rich. It has everything, the best people. And uh, so I'm, I'm really hoping that Maduro will respect the election and that we're going to have free and democratic election in five days and that all of the team is safe, Maria Corina and her team included, and for everybody to get out and vote and bring a change. Thank you, Anna, for that. And bringing it back to Canada, mm -hmm. I mean, all over mainstream media, all over social media, we're constantly hearing news for and against both sides. And I would love to know, what do you think is the biggest misconception about your campaign at this moment? The, the liberals would like you to believe that, that we're, that conservatives are some kind of radical departure from the way things have been in Canada. In fact, it's them that are the radicals. They're the, they're the, the extremists. They're the, they are the wackos. We're the ones who want to bring home the country that everyone knew and loved before Trudeau. Right. Uh, it's hard to believe, but you know, nine years ago, uh, anyone could afford a home. The average age of a new home buyer was 29 years old. The average home price was $450. The average rent for a one bedroom was 950 bucks. I was housing minister at the time. And crime was very low. You could, a lot of suburbs, people didn't even lock their doors. Um, but after nine years of radical, uh, extreme socialist policies that divide our people by race, ethnicity, that take your money, tax your food, punish your work, and just free criminals into the streets, the, everything's broken, and what I'm proposing is not is to get back to common sense. Let's get back to uh, a country where hard work pays off, with a powerful paycheck that buys affordable food, gas, and homes in safe neighborhoods, where people have freedom of speech, where they're judged on their merits, not their ethnicity, gender, sexuality, etc., where parents have ultimate authority over what their kids learn about sexuality and gender. Uh, where we go after criminals, not after hunters and sports shooters. Um, where we rebuild our military to have a strong standing in the world. That, that is the, the country we knew and the country we still love. That's what I want to bring home. And you mentioned a lot of topics that I think are important to our yeah. viewers, to young people, to immigrants. Let's start with housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am 27 years old. I am surrounded by people that dream mm -hmm. about owning a house. But realistically, unless their parents own a house, that they can then leave to them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like it's gonna be in any of our realities. How do you think that can be addressed? What needs to be done to make sure that people in my generation can afford a home? Well, we have to start with acknowledging why we're in this mess today. Uh, Canada wasn't like this before Trudeau. Like I said, it was very affordable to buy homes in Canada. And it should we should be the most affordable place in the world to get a home because we have so much space to build on. It's not like we're Singapore or Mexico City where there's just so many people and there's nowhere to put them all. Uh, we have an inf literally an infinite amount of space. And the problem is that we have this horrible bureaucracy that blocks home building. It takes seven or eight years to get a permit. That adds hundreds of thousands of dollars to the cost of every new home. And it drives up the co uh, drives most people out of the housing market. So I'm going to require municipalities speed up permits, free up land, cut development taxes to, to allow 15% more home building per year as a condition of getting their federal money. I'll uh, sell off 6,000 federal buildings and thousands of acres of federal land. In fact, every square inch of real estate that is not needed for the functioning of the federal government or that is not uh, a national park or ecologically sensitive will be considered for housing. Uh, we're going to get rid of the carbon tax to lower bu building material charges and we're going to focus on the trades, not just the professions, so we can have more boots, not more suits to build the homes. And as immigrants, you know, Anna and myself have a very clear idea of what it's like to come to this country yeah. and to have a dream of building a better future for your family. Yes. Unfortunately, a lot of those immigrants are getting blamed for some of the issues that are happening in this country, whether it's crime, whether mm -hmm. it's the overwhelmed healthcare system or the rise of cost of housing. Do you think there is an immigration problem in Canada, and what is the solution? And, and I ask this to both of you. Yes, the, uh, that problem has a name, Justin Trudeau. He caused the problem. The immigrant people did not cause the problem. They did what they were told. They, the rules were online, they followed the rules, and they came here. In most cases, they followed the rules. They did what he said they should do. Um, the problem is that he 
destroyed the common sense approach that worked for 150 years, where we brought in people in numbers that we could absorb into housing, health care, and the job market, where people came in lawfully, uh, where the international students actually studied and the temporary foreign workers actually filled jobs that Canadians couldn't fill. That was the system we had before, and that worked. If we get back to that, then we can bring, we can bring back uh, the best system in the world that gives high achievers and hard workers a chance to, free, to flee a bad situation and come to the best country in the world and achieve their dreams. What do you think? I agree. <laughs> And as a multilingual broadcaster, I mean, multiculturalism is at the core of what we do. And historically, companies like ours have been underfunded and we have been undervalued. And I quote um, something that you've said in the past that you would like to restore balance for small, local and independent mm -hmm. voices in the media that have been crushed. So I'm curious, how do you plan to achieve this? And what specifically do you value in Canadian media? In, what I value in Canadian media is freedom of the press, true freedom of the press. Uh, that means the government means a does lot not to control me. what you say, how you say it, what values you sh and information you share with your audiences. Uh, it also means that people compete, uh, news outlets compete for eyeballs and earlobes. They don't have apportioned shares of the market. They get the market based on the quality of the product they put out, just like uh, a supermarket or a, a restaurant would. Um, I would get rid of the censorship laws, C-11, C-63, C-18, the latter of which is blocking you from Instagram, Facebook, and possibly other platforms, so you could get back on those platforms. I would also make sure that the, the necessary advertising that the government does do gets over to independent media. It shouldn't be concentrated with Bell Controlled or Chorus or Rogers, the big oligarchs, they should not dominate it. They should get next to nothing of it, frankly. Um, and the current government is basically trying to help the big corporate controlled state-backed media. Um, I don't want to do that. I want to get rid of the favors for the big guys and allow for true entrepreneurial, independent, free market media. Which, which kind of leads into my next question. I think that a lot of people are scared to start a small business now because you almost get punished for being successful. And there right. are a lot of risks that come along with starting a brand new business. How do you plan to help these small business owners? And how do you maybe hope to incentivize it a bit more so you're not penalized simply for being successful and contributing to the Canadian economy? Yes, and, and this is a, a byproduct of Trudeau's socialist, radical socialist agenda as he seeks to punish anyone who succeeded independently of the government and then enrich a very small group of uh, government uh, friends through special handouts and favors for them. I want exactly the opposite. Get rid of the favors and the handouts and unleash free enterprise with low taxes, fast permits, and open competition uh, with um, a system that allows you to keep the fruits of, fruits of your labor. I've also announced that within 60 days of becoming Prime Minister, I'll launch a tax reform task force that will design for me a bring it home tax cut that will lower taxes on invest those who work, invest and make stuff in Canada so that we can bring home more powerful paychecks and production. Uh, that it will be simpler, cutting 20% of the compliance and enforcement costs of the tax system and fairer by cutting off the handouts, taxpayer funded handouts to big multinationals and using the savings to lower taxes for the working class people so that that waitress, uh, that, uh, that, high, that high school kid who gets his first job, they keep more of their paycheck and their work is actually re rewarded. That's my common sense plan. Common sense. And I want to shift things over to Anna. I have seen that you've been posting a lot about um, advocacy for different human trafficking issues that are happening worldwide. Would this be your advocacy or what would your priorities be if you were to be the future First Lady of Canada? Uh, I'm definitely focused right now on human trafficking. I have a project that would launch in August where I want to shed the light on the issue of human trafficking happening right here at home in our backyard. Um, it's happening more and more. It's growing and it's our girls. It's our women and our girls. Often we think that this is a third world problem in a far foreign land but it's happening right here. These women get coerced and human trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation it's still 
disproportionately higher than all of the other forms of human trafficking. But we also see human trafficking also for labor. And unfortunately, our immigrants are a big, big target when it comes to that. So I want to shed light on the problem here and hopefully that we can make changes through policy. And I'd love to know as well, just as a Latina, what it would mean for you to be the first Latina First Lady of Canada. <laughs> um, well, I'm hoping to be a strong voice for the Latin community. As, as you were saying, uh, it's unfortunate that somehow a lot of the blame is put on immigrants right now for things that are happening, bad things. So I just want to bring back and, and, and remind people that this country was built on immigration and that there is a positive immigration and a positive outcome from it. And I just want to be a positive model for that and be a strong voice and uh, keep our culture vibrant. And I'm a strong believer in multiculturalism. Um, and yeah, that's what I'm hoping to do. Amazing. And now, I think recently, online especially, but in mainstream media as well, it is kind of frowned upon for young people to vote conservative. I think that the conservative party is associated with an older, wealthier, whiter crowd. And I would love to know, what are you doing to appeal to those younger Canadians, to, to show them that you do care about what they care about, whether it's climate change or, or other topics that are important to them? Well, right now, in truth, we're crushing Trudeau with youth. If you look at the polling data, uh, Trudeau is now in third place. Um, he is, uh, you know, he, he is about as popular as a root canal with, with, with voters under the age of 40. And I'm in first place among that group. And the reason why is obvious. I'm the only one who will, gives you the hope of ever owning a home. I mean, Trudeau's destroyed. Like, I'll give you an example. I had a, a guy in my riding who said to me, he has the same job as his mother had, literally, in the same office building in downtown Ottawa. And yet, he cannot even come close to affording the same house that she bought. So he's living in the basement of that house. And she bought that house when she was in her 20s. So he's saying, wait a sec here, why is it before Trudeau, my mom with this job could buy a house, but now it's not possible? And they look around and say, Jagmeet Singh is offering exactly what Trudeau is offering. So who does that leave? The one guy who, who's actually delivered affordable homes when he was minister, who offers a common sense plan to reward hard work. You know, there's a misconception that young people just want a freebie from the government. That's not true. A freebie might be temporarily satisfying, but it's not fulfilling as a, as a life. Work is about not just about having uh, a living, it's about having a life. And pe young people want to work, they want to start businesses, they want to achieve something, they want to get married and have kids. And I'm the only leader that offers a common sense plan that will allow them to do that. And that is why I will win the youth vote. Uh, and that is why Trudeau is despised among Canada's youth. Just to add on to that, I despised. have heard from some people in my age range that there is still a little bit of a concern in terms of owning a home, but also having a planet on which to have that mm -hmm. home. Is there a sort of environmental mm -hmm. policy or some sort of climate change plan that you think would be important for Canada? We think technology is better than taxes. We need uh, nuclear power, small modular Boom. nuclear reactors, hydroelectric yeah. dams to power our grid emissions free. That means fast permits. Right now those projects take 20 years to get permitted. We could do that in two or three years and that way we could have abundant, and affordable and clean energy. Secondly, we, there's only one atmosphere. So pushing production out of Canada to more polluting for foreign jurisdictions not only does damage to our economy, but does damage to the earth. So right. I want to bring the production home to our country by mining strategic minerals in Canada through fast permits, rather than pushing that to, the, to China. And secondly, I want to sell our natural gas to wean Asia off of dirty coal. If India were to supply half of its new demand for electricity with our clean Canadian natural gas rather than dirty coal, it, were, it would displace 2.5 billion tons of global emissions, which is seven times the, sorry, which is three times the total emissions of our entire economy. So by selling our gas to that market, we can actually reduce global emissions and bring home powerful paychecks to our people. Trudeau and Singh just want to shut down our economy, shut down our industries, ban your car, uh, ban your straw, stop building roads. That's insane. That will do nothing for our economy, nor will a 61 cent a liter carbon tax. Nope. What we need is technology, not taxes, bring home production to our country. That's my plan. And just to close off this interview, we do reach 
different multicultural mm -hmm. communities across the country. Why should they support you? Why should they support Pierre and Anna? What do you think? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> you go. <laughs> well, look, uh, if you want a country where hard work gets you a powerful paycheck that buys affordable food, gas, and homes in a safe neighborhood, then you only have one option. The last nine years has been a nightmare. Everything's broken. Everything costs more, work doesn't pay, housing costs have doubled, crime, chaos, drugs, and disorder are common in our streets. That is the necessary result of Trudeau's wacko policies. Let's bring home the country that we knew and still love, where hard work pays off, where we ax the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime where you can be safe in your neighborhood, where you raise your kids with your own value, where you're proud to, to celebrate our common nationality under the beautiful Canadian flag. That's the dream. Let's bring it home. Thank you so much. Thank Muchísimas you much. gracias. Muchísimas gracias. gracias. Everyone has an opinion about Canadian federal politics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're going to finish this one up right there, guys. We know a lot more about Anna Poliev, and we knew a lot about Pierre Poliev. A little insight into the policies he'll be implementing. We do need a change. I hope the election is coming. There is a part of me that thinks that that is going to be resisted by the Liberal NDP coalition government as well. That wouldn't be a big surprise. My name is Aaron. This is Canadian Looney. We're covering Canadian politics, sharing what we're learning with our patriots, our subscribers, all the people that watch our channel. It's fun. Thank you for watching this video. We'll be back with more Canadian federal politics in the next one. See you next time. Thank you very much for watching. Anna Poliev is smoking. Pierre ain't looking bad either. Just saying. Catch you next video, gang.